Okay. <coughs> Hello. Um, this is going to be our first video on metric spaces. And this video is concerned about definition and examples of metric spaces. And uh, so, um, without wasting much time, let's see what we have. Well, uh, anyone who is into mathematics will tell you that there are different spaces that one has to understand as you try to do, for example, reanalysis, complex analysis, or you know, function analysis, differential equations, and so on. At the top, we have the um, topological space, which uh, has all these other spaces as special cases. Well, okay, uh, for a topological space, um, you know. And then in, in between here, we have the idea of metric spaces, okay? <coughs> and we try to understand what metric spaces are and why they are so important. So what this, what this diagram simply means is that every metric space is a topological space, but not every topological space is a metric space. And then there are very important kinds of metric spaces we call normed vector spaces. Uh, so, uh, norm vector spaces is a space with a normed, it's a vector space with a norm defined on it. And certain norms, uh, once you have a norm, you can use the norm to define a metric. So, but not every metric leads to a norm, because for you to have a norm vector space, you must first have a vector space. And every vector space has a zero element. But not every metric space needs a zero element, okay? So, that is the reason why you know norm vector spaces are metric spaces, but metric spaces don't have to be norm vector spaces. And then, if you want to look at more special spaces, you have inner product spaces, where you have an inner product defined on a norm vector space, and so on. So, what we are concerned about in this video is this kind of space right here, which is the metric spaces. We want to know what these spaces are. At least in this video, we look at definition and some examples. And then uh, there will be, I think, 10 uh, versions of this video. This is just part one. So um, let's see what we have next. So basically speaking, if you have an abstract space or an abstract set, you want to have some idea of distance, right? Um, you know, usually when we talk about distance, in our mind, we have the, no the notion of if I want to move from point A to point B, if I, if I suppose that there is no obstruction, then I'm thinking about the shortest possible distance. And we all know that in some scenarios, the shortest possible distance is just a straight line from point A to point B, but in other cases, the shortest possible distance is not a straight line. So that idea of trying to generalize the shortest possible distance, depending on what kind of space you are in, is what leads to a metric on or a distance function on a set. So basically you have any general set or space, whatever that space is, and you want to, to give an idea of uh, the distance between the two objects. So this leads to a distance function. And this function it must have some very important properties. For example, it cannot be negative. Um, <coughs> the distance between two points cannot be negative, right? Of course, the distance between two points can be zero, but it cannot be negative. That would not make intuitive sense. So we don't want the distance between two points to be negative. So whatever function we will use as our metric or distance function must have the property that, of course, the distance between two objects, whether the objects are distinct or not, cannot be negative. The other important thing about is the idea of the indifference. The distance between two different points should be strictly positive. I, I mean, you ca if you have two distinct points in the space, the distance between those two points must be strictly positive. This is uh, this makes sense. I mean, to even someone who is in class one, this is a very basic concept, which is which is obvious. Okay, and we need this this condition. Uh, we need our function to satisfy this very basic condition. The other thing about it is that is the concept of symmetry. I mean, I mean, the distance from point A to point B should be the same as the distance from point B to point A. Okay, uh, the shortest distance from A to B should be the same as the shortest distance from B to A. So this is a very important idea that we need into our function to satisfy. And of course, the last one is the uh, idea of triangle inequality, which, which we all know is important when we work with vectors. 
So these are the four properties that we want our function to define. So let's give a more precise definition of what a metric is. So a distance function. So you have an abstract set, which is x, okay? And um, you define a function from the cross product of x with itself uh, into the real numbers. Of course, you can see the definition that we have here excludes uh, the negative numbers because from our definition, we want this function to be non-negative. So we, we're going to take two pair of numbers, x and y, and we want this such that, well, if the distance between x and y is zero, this can happen if and only if x is equal to y. So in other words, if this is x, x, then of course the distance from x to x should be zero because of course x equals itself. So this is a very important condition, okay? Uh, the only time you can have a distance between uh, two objects being zero is if the objects are equal within the set. And then this one talks about the symmetry. The symmetry is right here. The symmetry says the distance from x to y is the same as the distance from y to x. And this holds for every x and y within our set. And then we have the triangle inequality, or we can call it the, yeah, the triangle inequality, which says that you have any three objects. If I want to move from x to y, and x to z, this distance is less or equal to the sum of the distances from x to y and the distance from y to z. Now, if you have any function like this that satisfies these, these properties right here, then of course, um, I think I, I, uh, one of the properties is kind of missing, but it's, it's embedded within the definition of the function in that the distance from x to y should be greater or equal to zero. But that is obvious because of the way we define the function. Okay, the function, the image cannot be negative. So that condition is not explicitly stated, but it's obvious from the, the definition of the function, okay? From the functional notation that we have right on top here. So if you have a function that satisfies these properties, then it's called, we call this function a metric on the set X. And then you, this ordered pair is called the metric space, okay? This is a metric space with respect to this metric. Of course, the definition of a metric space depends really on the function D. So if you have just one set, you can have different metric functions defined on that set. So you can have different metric spaces. So whenever you talk about a metric space, you should be careful and be very clear about the, the function which, is in, in, in con which we are concerned about. So I will, I will say probably a metric space with respect to a given metric, okay? All right, so this is a very simple picture that explains what I just said. Well, the distance from A to B should be non-negative, so we don't want, uh, this is a very simple idea right here. And then this says that, well, if the distance, if A and B are different, then the distance is positive. So the only time you can have the distance between A and B equal to zero is when A is equal to B. And then this is the symmetry. The distance going from A to B should be the same as the distance going from B to A within this space. Okay? If, if this condition is not satisfied, if one of these conditions are not satisfied, the function we just defined is not a metric on the set X. Okay, so let's look at some obvious examples that we all probably come across in real life. Uh, this one is quite obvious because this is what we are usually used to on a straight line, okay? So you take the set of real numbers, R is a set of real numbers, and we define this function here. Of course, you see on the right-hand side, the code domain is defined as R. We included the negative, but of course the image of this function will always be non-negative, okay? So the distance between two functions and two points, x and y, is defined as the absolute of this difference. And this metric is the one we usually use, you know, in our everyday life on the real line. This is our idea of distance between two numbers or distance between two points on the real line. So this metric is usually referred to as the usual metric on R. Okay, uh, it's the metric that is just the absolute of the difference between x and y. It, and that makes sense in everyday life. So this is a very, very simple metric on the set of real numbers. Let's look at something more interesting. For example, if we have the set of real numbers squared, then that is the, the xy plane. Then we can again define a, another metric. Of course, we take a point in R2, we take another point in R2, and then we define this thing right here. Okay, so this is one point in R2, and this is another point in R2, and the distance between these two points is defined in this way. Uh, uh, this, is, this is just a straight line between the two points. And uh, of course, when we apply this distance function to R2, then this pair is called the Euclidean plane, okay? We, or the Euclidean metric on R2. 
And just to understand what this thing means is that, for example, if this is the first point, x1, x2, and this is the second point, y1, y2, then the distance will just be this, the distance from here to here is a straight line calculation, okay? Uh, this is actually the shortest distance in x in R2 between two points. So this is the Euclidean metric, okay? This is quite obvious to most people because when people talk about shortest distance in R2, this is their idea of what the shortest distance is. Okay, let's look at another example. Uh, we have here the, uh, now we can generalize the R and R2 to Rn. So we have a function from Rn and Rn into R. And it's defined in this way right here. Uh, this is the n-dimensional Euclidean space or the n-dimensional Euclidean metric, okay? So uh, once again, if, you if for example, if n is 3, then we have the, the Euclidean space. And so it will just be the straight line from one point in R3 to another point in R3. This is the shortest distance between these two points. So the Euclidean metric, okay, which is this function right here, it's quite, you know, quite normal. I mean, a lot of people can understand what this means. This is one of the easiest kinds of metric are uh, on a space that you can be able to explain to most people. Okay, then we have another metric on Rn, which is called the product metric. But this time, what we did is that we have these two points, and we define the distance between x naught and y naught to be the maximum of these components right here. So we 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 subtract x1 and y1, x2 and y2, x3 and y3, all the way up to xn and yn. And when we take the absolute values of all those differences, and the maximum absolute value happens to be the distance between x0 and y0. Of course, this is not a familiar, this, this kind of metric is not common. A lot of people cannot really, uh, you know, understand, you know, kind of like visualize what this metric is trying to say. But it's a very useful metric in most calculations. Uh, abstract calculations, and this metric, when we combine this metric with Rn, we have what we call the n-dimensional product space. So this is a very uh, useful metric in, in most calculations, in fact, and it's called the n-dimensional product space, okay? We uh, combine it with the set Rn. Another useful metric would be this one here, uh, which is called the, uh, now we have Rn, Okay, and then we define d star star from Rn to Rn, from Rn cross Rn to R. And this time, instead of taking the maximum of these absolute values, we sum up the absolute values. Okay, and this will be the distance from x0 to y0. This metric, well, is called the Postman metric. Okay, and I'll give you a, a clear example of what this means. But what it means is that when we combine this metric with the set Rn, we have what we call the n-dimensional Postman metric space. So let's try to understand what this metric really is trying to do. If you take, for example, a very simple example in R2, and you have this point A and this point B, if we were to apply the Euclidean metric, the distance between A and B will just be this straight line here, the length of this straight line, okay? The shortest possible distance. But the Postman metric will not be this, the length of this straight line. The distance in R2 from A to B will be first go this way and then go this way. Okay, so the Postman metric would be this sum plus that sum. And then we go in to see that, well, uh, it's going to be like, um, okay, it's going to be this plus that. So in, in, in the, in the Postman uh, metric space, the only way you can, the shortest way you can go from A to B is to first go right like this and then go vertically down to B. Whilst in the Euclidean space, of course, you can go from A to B straight by going A straight down to B. So you can see that one of these matrices uh, is, is, is kind of like, uh, it's not very common to people, all right? And of course, the, the second one is not quite common, all right? But this is an example of a distance function. Okay, another example of a metric that can be defined on any set, in fact, is what we call the discrete metric. What it simply does is you take any abstract set, x, with itself, and then you just define the distance from x to y to be 1 every time x is not equal to y. And then the distance from x to y to be 0 every time x is equal to y. This is a very simple metric okay, that you can define on any space at all. And it leads to what we call the district metric. Okay, For those of you who do topology, for instance, this metric usually 
can in Jehovah be called a discrete topology on the set. Uh, but we're not going to get into that. But what we just want to know, this is one of the easiest metric that you can define on any space. All right, so let's look at some very simple problems. Well, if what this really means is that if you have two metric functions on a set, of course this is off, then the sum of these two once again give you a metric. So just put this into your head. The sum of two different metric functions or distance functions is, is again a distance function. It will satisfy all the conditions that we stated, all the axioms for a metric on any set. The other thing also is that if you are dealing with continuous functions on this bounded interval a to b, then we can define the distance between two continuous functions on this bounded interval to be the integral from a to b of this absolute value. This again is a very popular metric uh, for those of you who do reanalysis and who have done reanalysis and uh, you know abstract mathematics or whatever. You've used this metric a number of times and it's very useful. And then we can generalize here the Euclidean metric in the form, instead of p equals to two, we can have p from one all the way to infinity. Of course, when p is equal to one, this is the Euclidean metric on R. And when p is equal to two, this is the Euclidean metric on R2. And when p was n, this is the Euclidean metric on, um, uh, this is the Euclidean metric on, on uh, yeah, this is the, when p is equal to two, of course, this is the Euclidean metric on R2. Uh, but this can be generalized easily to the Euclidean metric on any given space, okay? And of course, if you want to prove that you have to use this very important identity right here, okay? But we're not going to go into that because this this identity or this inequality that we have on the on the screen is going to help you to try to prove the triangle inequality uh, condition. But that is not the purpose of this video, okay? Thank you.